So I'm sure all of us, everyone in this room has, has learned a lot of lessons in life. And sometimes we learn lessons the easy way and sometimes we learn lessons the hard way. I know as a child, there were times that my parents gave me good advice and I took that advice and I learned the lesson the easy way. And you've done that as well. But other times you heard good advice from parents or pastors or leaders or teachers and you thought, no, I know better. I'm going to go my own way on this one. And you learned a lesson the hard way that probably that wise voice in your life was right and probably you suffered some pain for having to learn it the hard way. We've all learned some lessons the easy way and the hard way. I remember when I went off to college, uh, my dad gave me some advice. My, my dad and my mom are here today. He's the guy that looks like me. And um, he, uh, he said, hey, Kurt, just... Don't get into a serious relationship with a girl your first semester of college. It's not a good idea. Just make a lot of friends and get to know a lot of people. So what did I do? I got into a serious relationship with a girl the first week of college. And did it work out well? No, it was not Michelle. And so it wasn't the right thing at the right time. Not a good plan. Should have followed the advice. Had to learn it the hard way. But it happens. And now as parents, for us, we have to watch our kids do that sometimes. Sometimes they learn it the easy way. Sometimes we have to watch them learn it the hard way. Well, when we look at God's word, we see that the Bible isn't advice for us to consider if we want to do it or not. The Bible is God's authoritative word for us to obey. And here in Luke, as we continue looking at the ultimate week this month, this morning Jesus gives his disciples a final ultimate lesson. So this is the ultimate lesson. And in many ways, this lesson captures Jesus' ministry all through the gospel of Luke. This comes at a pivotal point. Last week, we saw him celebrating the Lord's Supper with his disciples, the Last Supper. We talked a lot about communion. And next week, we're getting into the Garden of Gethsemane leading right up to the cross. But this is Jesus' his, his, his last lesson for his disciples before the final events leading to the cross. And it really captures what his kingdom is all about. So I want to ask you, if you're able, to please stand while we read God's word. We are going to read Luke 22, verses 24 to 38. Luke 22, 24 to 38. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. This is the disciples. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. And he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me, and he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, Look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, It is enough. This is God's word for us this morning. You may be seated. Well, I love my kids dearly, but any of you who are parents or have spent much time with kids know that there are moments where they fight about the silliest things. Moments, it's like, are we really talking about this right now? Is this really what we need to be discussing in this moment? Like, dinner is all set and the table's ready. We're ready for a nice meal. And now you're choosing to argue about what color your cup is? Not the right time, kids. 
Well, that's kind of what the disciples are doing right here. And they're not children. They're teenagers and young adults for the most part. But they're kind of acting like children here because right after Jesus has had the Last Supper with them and right before he's going to the cross, they decide to have a dispute about which one of them will be the greatest. Come on, guys. Really? Now? Not the right time. Bad look here for you, disciples. Jesus is more patient than we are as parents, by God's grace, and that's a good thing. And he takes this opportunity to teach them the ultimate lesson. If I could capture this lesson in the simplest form, simplest phrases, it would be this. Jesus served, so we serve. That's his point. He served, so we serve. In the lesson, he explains to the disciples how power works in the world. He says, for the Gentiles, that's the non-Jews, they exercise lordship. They exercise authority. That's how power and authority work for them. We see that in our world. Worldly leaders tend to be dominant, authoritarian, power-hungry people. We can think of great conquerors in world history like Genghis Khan or Napoleon Bonaparte or Alexander the Great, and we study them as victorious winners in their times. That's the norm. It's what's ex expected and respected to be a powerful, strong leader, to exercise lordship. And Jesus says in the text, they're called benefactors. That's a positive word. They're benefactors. They're respected for exercising authority in the worldly way. It's normal. They're showing how strong they are. They're taking charge. And this is often what's rewarded in the world and in our worldly systems. It's considered good and strong to exercise authority. When, we, uh, when my wife and I lived in China, we observed this. We saw this play out. So uh, we spent a year in China running a, a Tex-Mex restaurant called the Texas Cafe. Many of you know that. And we went there, and as the leaders of this cafe, I had the mindset that servant leadership is a good thing. When I worked at a restaurant in high school, I remember the boss and founder of the restaurant was a guy who would jump in and do anything, whatever it took to get the job done. He wasn't higher than thou. He would get in there and wash the dishes, mop the floor, make the sandwiches, whatever it took to get done. And I respected him for that. It was good leadership, servant leadership. And so I thought, okay, that's the kind of leader I'll be at our restaurant. So I started jumping in, mopping the floors, washing the dishes. And I noticed the staff starting to become more distant and even disrespectful to me. I'm like, what's going on here? And finally, one of them had the courage to come to me and say, hey, Kurt, when you like wash the dishes, it's like really bad. Like, none of us respect you when you do that. It's quite shameful. Like, you should be able to pay someone to do that. A boss doesn't do that. And I was like, whoa. That's like a total paradigm shift for me. Like, in my mindset, as, as a Christian, the leader serves and gets their hands dirty. But for them, no. It shows you're weak. You can't pay someone to do the low work. So it really frustrated me at the time. I was like, well, what do I do here? I want to keep serving, but I don't want to be disrespected. It's just a really awkward situation. But that's how power and respect typically work in the world. It's what we often see. In America, and I think this is partly because of Christianity's impact in our country over history, we tend to like leaders who are down-to-earth and relatable. That's not common. That's not the norm in a lot of the world. But we want leaders who get their hands dirty with us and are relatable with us and who are like us. You know, that's why politicians, they always have some story in their speech about missing, uh, meeting old Mrs. Honeycutt for pie and talking with her around the dinner table in rural Iowa. And you're like, okay, I'm sure you really did that. Or meeting old Jimmy outside the steel mill. And as we were pumping gas together, he told me his story about his family. Okay, we, know, we get it. You're one of us. Okay. But actually, you're probably not. You're a politician. Whatever. Pretty lame, if you ask me. But listen for it. It's there almost every story or every uh, politician. But it's because we do like relatable leaders, and they're at least trying to be relatable. Well, Jesus teaches us here the ultimate lesson about leadership. And look again at verses 26 and 27. Let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. 
Now, it's interesting Jesus mentions age here. The, the greatest becomes as the youngest. This would especially encourage the disciples in that moment who were younger. They were not yet of an age of great respect, most of them at that time. It also fits with his previous teaching about becoming like a child to inherit the kingdom of God, valuing that childlike spirit. But Jesus, again, he's, he's flipping the rules upside down. He's going against what's normal. He talks about the one who serves those who recline at the table, and the one who serves is greater. You know, I picture with this, like in our culture, the, the celebrities and the elites who go out to dinner and get the $10,000 bottle of champagne and the finest cut of steak and caviar, and they're sitting around the table enjoying their luxuries, and you got the young college student or the single mom who's working three jobs and just trying to get by and coming out and serving them this food, and it's like, who has the power here? The people at the table, the people enjoying the luxuries the luxuries that could pay off the debts of these people serving them. And yet Jesus says, who's greater in the end? It's the one who serves. It's the one who serves. That's why many say that the kingdom of Jesus is an upside-down kingdom. The weak are strong. The leaders serve. And this is rooted in Jesus himself. He says, I am among you as the one who serves. Jesus sets the example here. He's the servant. This is right around the time that he washed their feet. And he will perform the ultimate act of service by dying on the cross for their sins and for our sins. He came not to be served, but to serve. The most powerful person in the history of the universe, indeed the creator of the universe, he came not to exercise lordship, but to serve. Philippians 2 says he emptied himself and became like a servant. Jesus served, so we serve. Then in verses 28 to 30, he assures them that their serving will be rewarded. He commends them that they've stayed with him through the trials thus far. They're about to abandon him, but they've stayed with him thus far. And he says they will sit and dine with him later in the kingdom. The reward is coming. And he even says they will have 12 seats to rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, this is a specific verse for the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, showing again how the new covenant fulfills the old covenant. And that these 12 will, in some sense, rule over the 12 tribes of Israel because these 12 are the apostles of the New Testament faith. They're the ones who write down the New Testament that tells us of the kingdom of Jesus. And they're the ones who start to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to all nations. These 12, though they may be low and young now, they will serve in powerful ways and ultimately recline with Jesus at table in his kingdom. And again, we see the Old and New Testament fitting together here. The Bible likes the number 12. The bottom line here for us, friends, is we are called to serve. If you are a leader, you serve. Christians should love the phrase servant leadership. It's right here in the text. The leader serves. This is the heart of the kingdom of Jesus. This is the heart of the gospel of Jesus. And to the extent that you have leadership roles, you serve. Pastors should serve the church. CEOs should serve their companies. Husbands should serve their wives. Parents should serve their kids. That doesn't mean you let kids run the home. You still need to discipline them and lead them, of course. But we have a servant heart, a servant posture even towards our kids. I love how this happens in our church. Church members serve foster kids, special needs kids. We see this play out in our ministries here all the time. It's really cool. I, I, I love it in our foster parent night out ministry that happens. I, I think we see this idea from Luke 22 coming to life so beautifully. The, the fourth Friday of the month, we have FPNO, Foster Parent Night Out, and we come together after a busy week to serve kids in need. I love it. We, we see people, we, we see men in our church who are often serving in high positions or stressful tech jobs and exhausted at the end of the week, and they show up here to chase around a four-year-old who has limitless energy. And if you've been here, you know what I'm talking about. Some of those kids are getting 30,000 steps just in the three hours they're here. It's crazy. 
but we're serving them. Some of the women are coming after a long week of work or caring for the home and watching kids at home, and they show up again to serve kids even more on Friday night, kids who are not their own. It's powerful. Teens jump in after a full week of school and serve these foster kids. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ on display. It's powerful. It's awesome. I love it. And we see this in so many ministries at our church. Servant-heartedness on display. When we use power and authority and strength to serve, we demonstrate the gospel. And it opens hearts of people in ways that sometimes our words cannot. Friends, let's be a church full of people who do not exercise lordship, but who exercise service. That's what Jesus did for us. And so that's what we're called to do for others. Galatians 5.13 affirms this. For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Are you a servant? Do you serve? Serve is one of our four core verbs at the journey. Our four verbs uh, that we hope members will do is gather, connect, serve, and go in our culture of love and grace at the journey. Do you serve? I'm not asking this so much as do you serve in a formal ministry at the journey, though I hope you do or will consider doing so. But even more, do you have a servant posture in your life? Is that your attitude towards people? That you're willing to get in the trenches and do the hard, dirty work. Even if it means sometimes being stepped on by others and being hurt by others. Are you willing to get in there and serve with humility towards others? I love seeing this at our church. I, I want to mention uh, Pastor Paul here. He doesn't know I'm going to do this, but... Pastor Paul is a guy who does this very well at our church. You probably don't even see all the ways that he serves behind the scenes. He doesn't have to be an upfront guy, but if he's not playing bass, he's in the tech booth. If he's not in the tech booth, he's working with kids. If he's not working with kids, he's working with the teens. He does a lot of things behind the scenes with a really beautiful servant heart. I appreciate that. I also loved seeing it at the women's conference last week. We had a group of men who came, showed up, and served. It's a powerful witness that speaks do you serve? Jesus did. Now, our second point this morning that we see in the text is that as servants, we are targets. As servants, we are targets. So from verses 31 to 34, Jesus addresses Peter. And he tells Peter that Satan wants to sift him like wheat and destroy him. Satan wants to test Peter and see if Peter is really good wheat or if he's weak chaff. And indeed, anyone who follows Christ with courage and takes this servant posture is going to be a target for the enemy. He doesn't want us to serve, and he wants to separate us from our servant leader, Jesus Christ. He wants to show us to be useless chaff who's just like the world, exercising lordship. Now, Peter is confident. He'll stand firm. He says, I'm ready to die for you, Jesus. Jesus knows that's not the case just yet and that Peter's going to deny him and Rob's going to preach about that next Sunday. And so Jesus tells him, before the rooster crows, you're, you're going to deny me three times. There's an important lesson here for us that Satan wants to sift us like wheat. We've seen this a lot in recent months as we've looked at Luke, as we've looked at Daniel, that we have to be awake to the fact that we have an enemy who wants to attack us, who is attacking us. He's using all kinds of weapons to do so. Weapons of destructive worldviews out there. Weapons of wolves in sheep's clothing and churches. Weapons of our own twisted selfish desires. Do you see how you're under attack? How you're a target? You are. C.S. Lewis in his classic work, The Screwtape Letters, brilliantly imagines the strategies of the devil in attacking God's people. And he said it was one of the hardest works he ever wrote to try to put himself in those shoes. But he uses the character in the book Wormwood 
to represent the devil's schemes against us. There's a lot of quotes I could have used, but I like this one. This is from Wormwood, so representing the evil side. And they say, a moderated religion is as good for us, the dark side, as no religion at all and more amusing. It's very C.S. Lewis uh, writing there. But the point is that a nice, comfortable, moderate, lukewarm religion is a great tool for the devil and perhaps even amusing. Puts a target on our back. Church, you cannot be asleep in a lukewarm faith, in a comfy, cozy Christian cocoon. You're under attack. And that's an easy tool for him to hit. It's just a moderate, nice faith. He can pull you away from God if you're not careful, if you're not anchored in Christ. And yet we see in the passage that Jesus says some more to Peter, some comfort, some encouragement to assure Peter that he won't let Satan sift him and destroy him. He prays for Peter. You see, he he says he prays for Peter. Isn't that something? Do you know that he prays for us too? Look at Hebrews 7.25. It says, consequently, he, this is Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. God the Son, Jesus Christ, intercedes for you right now before the Father. Jesus is praying for you. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit does the same thing too. So God the Son and God the Spirit are standing on your behalf before God the Father, praying for you. It's kind of crazy to think about, right? What are you going through these days? What are your trials and struggles? Jesus is representing you before the Father in prayer. Talk about power. Talk about strength to have Jesus bringing prayers to the Father before you. Beautiful truths about the Trinity here. That should give us some strength. And then we know, as the story goes on, Peter denies Jesus three times. But even in our verses today, Jesus says, when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. He knows Peter's faith will endure to the end. He's going to stumble. He's going to fall back three times. But he'll be restored. And he will end up being a pillar of the faith, leading the church in Jerusalem and being one of the foundational disciples and spreading the gospel, even writing part of our New Testament. Jesus prays and Jesus accomplishes his purposes. So church, remember that you have an enemy that wants to crush you. And you may be feeling that intensely this season. You may feel at the end of your rope, but take heart. The King of Kings is lifting you up. He's on your side. He served you and he is serving you and he's praying for you. You can get through this with his strength. And through his strength, you will be victorious in the end. You're a target, but you'll win. Now, this leads to our final section of the passage. And I want to put this in the form of a question. And that's do we serve with swords? We have this interesting little section here in verses 35 to 38, and it talks about swords. So in verse 35, Jesus asked the disciples if they had all that they needed when they went out in the past, and he told them, take nothing with you. That's in Luke chapter 10. And they went out, and sure enough, they had all that they needed. People provided for them. God provided for them. Everything worked out. So why is Jesus changing his mind now? Why is he telling them now, you need a knapsack, and you might even, you need some swords? It says even sell your cloak and get a sword. What what do we do with that? Do we do the same thing? Winter is over. Should we go sell our jackets and get some swords, get ready for the battle? That would be bad Bible interpretation, all right? Don't go to the nearest sword shop. I don't know where that is. If you know, I'd I'd be curious to see it. It sounds cool. (laughs) Some of you know one. That's great. Um, (laughs) What is Jesus doing here? Why is he saying to sell a cloak and get a sword? Well, I think there's two things going on, two observations I want to make with these tricky verses. First, Jesus says he's fulfilling prophecy with this. It says, he's quoting from Isaiah 53, 12, 
that he will be numbered among the transgressors. And so there's a sense that he and his disciples, though they are the innocent ones, they're going to look like the guilty ones. They will be numbered among the transgressors. And so even having a couple of swords, it makes them look like a gang of robbers instead of a a gang of disciples following a Jewish rabbi, which is what they are. And so he will be numbered among the transgressors. They're going to look like the bad guys. And then ultimately that's fulfilled in Jesus looking like a transgressor by dying on the cross, a criminal's death. So there's a sense in which even a couple of swords helps to fulfill that prophecy. That's what he's saying here. But then second, he's telling them they will face opposition. He's telling them ministry is not going to be easy for you. And I think Jesus is actually setting them up here to drive home the ultimate lesson about serving yet again. Just think about it. They have two swords They have two swords, and he says, it's enough. Now, we don't know if he's saying it's enough, like that's enough swords, or if he's kind of saying it like enough. Like you kind of missed the point here, guys. It's not about the number of swords. But think about it. Two swords in the hands of some like fishermen and a tax collector, they're not going to beat the Roman armies coming to arrest them. (laughs) Not unless they're like, you know, Jackie Chan in an old movie, and he can just kill 100 guys with his hands. I don't think James and John have that skill. So what is he doing here? Two swords aren't going to make the cut. I think he might be setting him up because what happens in the story, if you know it, Peter pulls out his sword when they come to arrest Jesus and he cuts off the ear of one of the servants. And what does Jesus do? Does he say, get up your swords. It's time to fight. Why did you guys bring two? We need more. Onward, Christian soldiers. This is our moment, guys. No. He rebukes Peter and heals the man's ear. That's strange, especially since he kind of said to bring the two swords. And we know that in the rest of the New Testament, the apostles never pick up swords. They never use violence to spread the gospel. That's not what they do, and there's no mandate for us to do that. We're never called to physically fight for the gospel. That's why I think Jesus is setting them up to really drive home this ultimate lesson that our kingdom is about serving Followers of Jesus serve, not fight. We will face opposition and the world is hostile toward us. It will be hard, but we're not like the armies of the world, seeking power, seeking to rule over others. We serve. We don't go out with swords to cut off the kills, of, cut off the ears of our opposition. We serve. We don't go out to spread some kingdom of Christendom in the world and fight crusades. No, we serve. Jesus told us to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us, not stab them with swords. We serve. Now, don't misunderstand me here. I'm not saying that all Christians must be total pacifists in the world. Some Christians believe that, and I respect that view, But we are also citizens of a nation. And I do think there are times we may need to pick up the sword or fight in the military for the sake of the nation. To go and execute justice, protect the vulnerable, and fight evil in the world. I'm deeply grateful for our men and women in uniform who do that. But we don't pick up the sword to fight for the church or to spread the gospel. There's no biblical basis for that. And Jesus is making the strong statement here that his kingdom is not like the kingdoms of this world. His kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is made of servants. So if we want to see our churches grow, if we want to see people come to know Jesus, we serve. We spread the gospel through service and then we proclaim the gospel message as we serve. The greatest ones serve. This is why we're doing Love Leander. We're going to just go out and serve people, people who might hate us otherwise, people who might think what we're doing right now on a Sunday morning is nuts. We're going to go serve them. That's why we're doing that prayer and pastries event for the, the CPS staff. I don't know if they like us. I don't know if they would come to our church. We're going to go serve them. We're going to go show love to them. It's hard for people to hate us when we're cleaning up their lawn or giving them baked goods. We serve them. Church, isn't it interesting that this is Jesus' final teaching before he goes to the cross? 
This is the ultimate lesson from Luke 22. Serving is fundamental for a Christ follower. Humility is necessary for a Christ follower. We are backwards from the world, and it's an upside-down kingdom. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I want to ask you to consider, isn't Jesus an amazing Savior? Aren't you drawn to him at least a little bit? The, the Savior who, who the, we believe created all things, he's God, and yet he served, he washed feet, and he died for us, died for your sins, died for my sins. Don't you want to follow him? Isn't that the type of person you want to follow? The one who serves you? We've all sinned and turned away from him. We were like enemies and he served us and he died for us. His offer is extended to you. Will you give your heart to him and follow him? Why not? And if you're here and you do know Jesus, then ask yourself this. Do I take this servant posture in my life? Do people around me describe me as servant-hearted? If you're married, would your spouse describe you that way? If you're a leader, would your, the people under your authority describe you that way? I hope you have the posture of the servant leader. And may this ultimate lesson from Jesus help us to serve more and ultimately help us to spread the gospel more.